I think people hopefully read the book and, uh, uh, and I'm going to ask Tom, if, if you would, uh, if you would just start out, Tom, by uh, talking a little bit about what made you decide to write the book uh, and some of the challenges you had in just researching from, you know, that, that, that over a century ago uh, kind of data where uh, I, I don't think the Internet was, was, was storing stuff back in the 1850s. No, they had telegraphs. and uh, <laughs> There you go. Um, yeah, well, it's an easy question to answer because uh, I have been writing about baseball since I was about late 20s, and that's a long time, and uh, got more and more interested over time in how baseball started, which the 19th century, the amateur, the pre-professional era, that's really what I get excited about. And, you know, I realized about five or 10 years ago that after spending about 30 years researching this, and I've written a couple of books about early baseball, that, you know, I didn't know the answers to any of the really biggest questions about it. And that's what's so interesting to me. And if you read my book, you know, I start by talking about the origin stories that aren't true. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was, it's kind of fascinating when you think about it, that so much has been written about it, and so many people have studied it, and the stories have been told over and over again, and we really don't know the ABCs of it. And by that, I mean, you know, at one point uh, in the uh, pre-Civil War period, we have no national sport. We have no professional sports at all, except, you know, uh, no professional team sports. We have boxing and horse racing and things that people gambled on. But this world that we live in now, which is full of entertainment and professional sports leagues, did not exist. And so how did it happen? And there was also local bat and ball games in all different parts of the United States that were all different that nobody's heard of anymore. And there was cricket, which was played by a lot of people. We had a lot of immigrants from Great Britain who played cricket. Um, all of our early baseball players played cricket, which is kind of interesting. And so what happened? How did what we call baseball is just the bat and ball game that they played in lower Manhattan in New York. That's all it was. If you got in the time machine, went back to about 1850, you'd see, well, in Boston, they played one way. In Philadelphia, they played another. It was quite different. There's other games that you've in different places in Connecticut. And there were a lot of local variations of cricket, rounders, bat and ball games, and not rounders, but things like it. And um, so very suddenly, starting in about the 1850s and happening in less than 10 years, this regional game, which is a folk game, you know, it's not very organized, suddenly becomes taken seriously and then it spreads. And it's our national pastime in about a decade, and of course, in that decade, civil war was fought, which was a bit of a distraction. So, you know, it's a fascinating phenomenon, and the stories that we've heard about how and why are none of them are the slightest bit true. So that interested me. And the book I wrote before this one uh, was kind of a strange book. Um, we have the cemetery in Brooklyn called Greenwood, which is founded in 1838, and it's full of lots of prominent people from the metropolitan area and the rest of the United States. Um, it was basically the highest prestige place to be buried in the middle and late 19th century. Um, and it occurred to me, because I kept having to go there when I was researching early ball players, and I'm talking about amateur players, so 1840s, 50s, 60s. Um, I kept having to go to the same place because so many of them are buried there. And it dawned on me that there's actually several hundred of if you took maybe the 500 most important people from the amateur era, you know, a good 40 or 50 percent of them are in this one place, which is also very strange. So it's a national sport. Why are so many people buried in one place in Brooklyn? And then I just I wrote a book about it and it was published by the cemetery. And I think it's uh, read. It's been read by about um, 500 people. But what I learned from it was that the answers to these questions that I had been wondering about. Uh, don't have a lot to do with sports. They have a lot to do with other things that were going on in American history, uh, transportation, economics, culture. These things were all where the answers were. 
So that was the sort of thing that I learned writing that book. And then I realized there was a bigger book in there about really how baseball happened. And that's what the title is. How did it happen? You know, we, you've heard Abner Doubleday. You've heard about Alexander Cartwright and the Knickerbockers, maybe if you're interested in that baseball origins. And none of those things are really true. So after I start by talking about the stories that aren't true, I tried to tell the story of what I think really happened. And it's fascinating because it's so unknown. So that's my answer to why I wrote the book. I think it, uh, one of my first takeaways from the book is, I do think and it's probably where the double day uh, and Spalding stories come from. It's like, we want a nice tied up, here's where it started on this day, you know, so we can have a, you know, we can commemorate the day and it, and it wasn't that, it's not that easy. Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of it that everybody will wants a story like that and they'll make one up if they don't have one. But there's also something else going on, which I grew, dawned on me as I'm researching it, which is, you know, I do a lot of genealogy. I don't know if any of you are interested in that. And you end up doing that when you're researching early ball players um, or anybody historical. Um, and one thing that I learned a long time ago was that people tell lies about their family history and they make up stuff. And those things turn out to be, in many cases, more significant than the truth. Because yeah. when people lie about something, it tells you who they are, what they want you to believe, what about, about their identity. And so the, the two main baseball origin stories are not just, you know, baloney. They're also made up for a reason. That was also pretty fascinating. So... When you said the people want to believe that there's a time and place and a person who invented something, that's true. But there was an added benefit in the Doubleday story, which is if somebody invented it in 1839 one day, it can't be English. That's a big important point. Because baseball, when people decided, and, and I talk about why in the book, when they decided we needed a national sport for all kinds of reasons, and they're interesting, um, cricket was a candidate and yeah. you know how many other former British colonies play cricket almost all of them but we didn't want to because we're a little different and you know I get into the reasons why and the more you learn about America in the early and mid 19th century the more you realize that it was not going to happen we were not going to play an English sport there's too much hostility and envy and bitterness between the two countries and also our sense of identity as being special and different from England related, but we don't want to be their younger brother. We're not their child. Uh, we, that was expressed in sport. And so we wanted our own sport that we could say was a native invention. And actually the funny thing is it is a native invention. I don't believe that it descended from an English sport, but um, the lie was made up in support of that. So, you know, when Abner Doubleday story was invented in the early 1900s, it was had to do really with professional baseball's marketing itself as a patriotic American institution. That's what Spalding was interested in. Uh, the other story is, has some similarities, but it's older, the Knickerbocker and Cartwright story. But they're also both essentially marketing because amateur baseball was kind of a movement. It was selling itself. It was trying to convince people to get interested in it. Um, and it was you know, motivated by this idea that we needed to unify the country with an institution that we could all have in common. That was a part of it, and people said that. Another part of it was really about public health and, and making Americans healthier, and it's the reason why you see so many medical people involved in early baseball, which has always puzzled me. I, I found it fascinating how teams uh, gathered around trades like the firefighters and uh the militia the state militias all had their little teams and and that's kind of where teams coalesced around trades and as you mentioned the, the medical profession was and that that was the first time i'd heard that um what what were some of the biggest surprises you got as you started doing the research uh that that you didn't expect to conclude or uh, write about? Well, uh, the thing I just mentioned was a big surprise that, you know, I always 
you know, even when I was a kid, when they told me the Abner Doubleday story, it didn't really, um, I didn't really believe it. it. It doesn't really make sense, right? That one day a guy shows up with a drawing in a field and that becomes a national sport. But finding out there was a reason for it, that was interesting and surprising. But I'll mention another surprise, and this one really surprised me. Uh, one of my last chapters is about the Cincinnati Red Stockings. And if you guys know your 19th century history, you know the team I'm talking about, the one that went undefeated in 1869. Um, and that team did a lot to sell baseball to the country by traveling from coast to coast and north to south. Um, and there's this thing that happens when I'm researching something sometimes, and you sit down, it happens a lot, you sit down to write about something, and I'm saying, I'm gonna, I have to write about Harry Wright, Cincinnati Red Stockings, and this great team. And the first thing I have thought I have is, honestly, what could I come up with that's new about this club? You know, it's been so written about. And, well, you know, my MO for the book was to always start with not the question of what and where and when, but to start with who. So who are these people? And that ends up taking you to undiscovered territory. So I started out by saying, well, who started this club? What kind of people were they and why were they doing it? And it's not as simple as you might think. And I, I run across a character who's very important in the founding and development of the Red Stockings named John Joyce. And I don't know if you ever heard of him. I'd never heard of him. He was the club secretary. I hadn't so until out, I read your book. Yeah, so he turns out to be really important. and then. You know, you know you're onto something when you see that you always have to compare what people said at the time, if you're a historian, with what the narrative became later, because it tends to change, right? People will decide what they think later. You know, when, when Gehrig hit his, uh, when Babe Ruth hit his called shot in 1932, it's not in the paper the next day. It's in the paper about two or three weeks later, because no one thought that he called his shot when it happened. Somebody, that kind of trickled out and it became a narrative later. And this uh, John Joyce character, everyone knew in the late 1860s how important he was. And they knew that he had, to some degree, assembled the team and found some of the prospects and the great players that they had. So 10, 15 years later, he's not in the story. And Harry Wright is, is, is the guy that did a lot of the things that Joyce did in the later version. Well, that's kind of suspicious. You know, why would they write this guy out of the story? And that led me into some really new stuff, which I never expected to find about this team, that didn't have a lot to do with baseball, but it explained a lot of things that happened. Um, John Joyce was kind of an underworld figure. I mean, he was an underworld figure. He was part of this organized crime network that sold, uh, uh, operated a numbers racket, and it was a national thing. And it, it, it were involved with bookmakers and politicians, and Cincinnati had according to one of the newspapers, I found 42 these uh, things that were selling lottery tickets and numbers was associated with this, if you know anything about numbers. Uh, it was also called policy. Um, this was a big revenue source for organized crime. And Mr. Joyce has his office in Covington because what he was doing was legal in Kentucky. And um, you know, then you realize that the Cincinnati Red Stockings had a non-baseball purpose. And a lot, a lot of it had to do with getting the president of the club elected district attorney in Hamilton County to protect the organization. I mean, that was pretty shocking. And if you read my book, you can read all the details, but absolutely fascinating story. And um, that was probably my biggest surprise. I was completely shocked by that. And I'm a little surprised that I haven't gotten more you know, reaction to it because Major League Baseball claims the red stockings as this pure corporate entity that is, in a way, the founders of professional baseball. You remember that the opening day game, the first game was always a Reds game for that reason, even yep. though the Cincinnati Reds have nothing to do with the Red Stockings. But um, that was definitely a, a surprise and, and a, a really interesting story. Any, any questions? So far? Yeah, I was wondering, are there some important things that you still feel you don't know and we don't know? Were there sort of pieces of the history that you weren't able to ferret out? Sure, absolutely. And, you know, it, it can be frustrating because when you're going that long ago, uh, there's a part in my book where I talk about how about 90, 80, 90% of what you're, we know about 
say 1850s is through newspapers, right? Well, they're not all digitized. They're not all in existence. So you get some random gaps, but you also get filters. Like the newspapers are written for a particular kind of person in those days. And they're not written for everybody. So there's huge areas of life that you're not going to read about in the paper. And in fact, it kind of creates the illusion that baseball was invented in the 1840s or 50s. And one thing I know from researching, there's, there's whole areas of darkness in baseball history. But one thing I know from researching is that there was something there. We just don't know what it is. You know, the idea that the Knickerbockers are the first organized club is completely untrue. We know, we know from fragments of information that there were lots of adult clubs decades before that. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there was adults playing baseball in something like a club in the late 18th century. But, you know, newspapers, because of their nature, didn't cover sports until 1830s, maybe. Um, then the fact that they're written for a particular kind of person means, I mean, to take one example, uh, there was a whole movement in the 1830s, 40s to get women to exercise, part of a feminist movement at the time. Um, I know that a lot of women participated in this and a lot of baseball men were actually involved in it, weirdly enough. But um, you can't find one actual person's name because the newspapers were not interested in anything that women did, as well as the racial aspect of this. We know that black and white people were both playing baseball going all the way back as far as we can tell in lower Manhattan. We know where they were doing it and it, someone will mention it. We, have, we really don't know like almost nothing about that. So that's something you have to keep in mind as a historian, because if you forget that, you're gonna you know, inadvertently think that lack of evidence means nothing was happening, but actually you don't know. And the final answer to your question is Jim Creighton, this really fascinating person that I have a whole chapter about, and I'm writing a book about him now because I'm trying to get to the bottom of this. Um, there's huge things about him that we don't know. And his impact was massive. You know, he's the first modern pitcher in a sense. And he really changed the game completely. And yet we don't know what he was throwing. Just to pick one thing, we don't know. We literally don't know what he was doing with the ball. And that's pretty fascinating. And I don't think we're going to find out, but I'm, I'm doing my best. Did, did we understand that uh, they just unearthed his uh, birth certificate? Well, uh, John Thorne kind of hyped that a little bit because we knew about it, but he okay. was just putting it out there for people that hadn't seen oh, it. Okay. It was found a few years ago because the thing is, you know, he died at 21. And um, it's a really interesting question of exactly how and why and what it had to do with baseball. And, and I think he was basically pitched to death because... <laughs> You know, we don't want to get into the gory medical details, but, you know, first you realize studying him that he was dominant and he was doing something that no one else could do. And, you know, you can guess if you know baseball because he was pitching underhand from 45 feet away. And the way people describe his stuff, it's hard to tell if he was throwing some kind of breaking pitch and I'm starting to suspect that he was, but we know that he had incredible velocity. And... So if you read the pitching rules of the 1840s and 50s and you try to imagine and read about the games, it's a hitter's game. You know, there's games that are 60 to 50. That's not even, doesn't even raise an eyebrow. It's like that kind of, I don't know if you have any pickup softball games like that. I have one that I'm playing tomorrow where the pitcher is basically supposed to groove it. And then the game is determined by how many, how hard you hit the ball and how well you field it. It's not about pitching. So, but Creighton, you could imagine based on, descriptions of pitching at that time that before he came along, people are throwing 40 or 50 miles an hour from 45 feet away. And he is throwing so much harder than that, that people's minds are blown. They talk about the catcher catching the ball before the batter gets the bat off the shoulder. Guys who faced him say it came out of the grass and was like a riser and I couldn't hit it. I just can't hit it. Pete O'Brien of the Atlantic said, I cannot hit this. So, you know, how fast was it? Well, if he was throwing 80, you get out your calculator. I think that comes out from 43 feet, say a release point. Uh, that comes out to about 96.7 miles an hour. That gives you a little bit of a clue about what he was doing. You know, the guys in my pickup game tomorrow can't hit 90, they can't hit 80, they can't hit 70. 
So he was yeah. dominating the best players of the time with this stuff that he had. Um, so where were we? I lost my train of thought. No, we. we oh yeah, the death streak. So he died. He died, and was it related to his pitching? And I think it was because he had a hernia, and what dawns on you when you read about his gradually breaking down of his health, he was had a huge workload. And then you realize that the people running <laughs> the club that he was playing for, for the Excelsiors, were a lot, the president was a doctor. A lot of them were doctors. The first baseman was a doctor. The club had been formed by a, partially formed by a club of physicians and medical students. And then if you read textbooks from the 19th century, you find out that the condition that Creighton had was very well understood. There's just nothing they could do about it. Um, but they understood it. He would have worn a truss of some kind for this hernia he had. And then you it can't help thinking that they risked his life because he, of what a good pitcher he was. And, you know, if you're not familiar with the mid-19th century, a pitcher was an everyday player then. Yeah. So if they're playing 20 times in a month, Jim Creighton is pitching 20 times. Add to that, there's no strike zone. And if the hitters don't feel like they can hit Jim Creighton, they can just stand there and watch 50 pitches go by. So in a way, I believe he was pitched to death and by people that yeah. knew or should have known that they were risking his life. Jim? Yes. Uh, do you think uh, Creighton's motion was something like we would see today in a good uh, college uh, women's fast pitch softball game? Yes, I do. I do. That's a great point. And I'm actually interviewing. Hey, I have your attention, please. Family will. story time. We'll be starting in our first floor meeting room in three minutes. Please join us for family story time now. Oh, I got Tom, sorry. Tom, sorry to miss Tom, that. That's the, uh, that's the joys of, of a free room at the library. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> I hope nothing embarrassing happens in my house behind me, but um, okay. <laughs> I'm going to be interviewing women's softball pitching experts and talking to them about what Creighton was doing because um, I'll give you a heads up because I haven't, you know, I, there's more I need to find out about it, but what Creighton was doing sounds to me like what they call a riser in underhand softball. It's the type of hard breaking pitch that jumps up. That's the way people described it. It was fast and it had an unpredictable upward break. And that would kind of make sense. But you know, people at the time didn't really understand what he was doing. And they were that was still the lemon peel yeah era ball which adds an extra level of uh, problems trying to understand it because no one plays with those kind of balls anymore and you know if you ever pitch you know that stitching and how you grip the ball is everything yeah. yep steve i was just going to comment even probably before the advent of women's fast pitch softball it was men's fast pitch softball which used to be really big still is in parts of the country and it is i know like in new zealand it's very yeah big. and i know in western canada it's popular yes chime in again on what steve said my dad was a real good fast pitch softball player and even when he was you know we're out in the backyard playing catch he was so fast that I couldn't catch him until I got to be about 14 or 15. And then he had he had a what he called an in shoot, an out shoot, and a drop. So he had a sharp breaking pitches in, out, and down. And so I I've, I've seen that. I've tried to catch that. And yeah, uh, I mean that could be what Creighton was doing. Was doing. Hard. It could be what Creighton was doing. Um and um, you know, the interesting part is that. The hitters who were totally overmatched by him, um, some of them said that he must have been cheating. And if you read the pitching rules of his time, it says it basically says you can't throw the ball; you have to pitch it, and the arm has to be dead underhand; it can't be the slightest bit to the side. And what they, you know, the word pitching comes from the fact that they they wanted you to pitch the ball with a stiff arm like horseshoes. And throwing was when you your arm started out bent and straightened in your motion, and that was illegal. But you know, people like your dad could get a lot on the hmm. ball. Really, I never knew throwing. the difference. Thanks. Yeah, without throwing. <laughs> well, how? 
May I have your attention, please? Right, one Family more. story time for all agents is starting right now in our first floor meeting room. Again, family story time for all agents is starting now in our first floor meeting room. Come on down. Uh, by, by the way, Tom, uh, the, the last question came from Jim Tootle. Jim's the, he was the author of the book on vintage baseball, the, the McFarlane uh, oh, yeah. published book that Jim Z was the author. He plays oh, on the local, uh, uh, we have a couple guys in here that are associated with the uh, local vintage baseball team, the, uh, the Ohio Village Muffins, just nice. F FYI. All right, congratulations. Um, the other thing about Creighton that's interesting is that he did something no one else in his time did. He lifted weights. And uh, Joe Leggett, his catcher, who had been a fireman, um, and there was sort of a small group of people in the United States interested in weightlifting in the 1850s, and firemen and cops were a lot of them. And Joe Leggett encouraged Creighton, who wasn't very big, to throw a uh, lift weights and to throw an iron baseball in his backyard. And he did that for a whole off season and came out with a lot of velocity. It did not help. It did not help. If you have an inguinal hernia, the doctor will tell you to be careful with weightlifting, twisting, lots of physical stress. Well, that's exactly what this guy was doing. I think his pitching motion involved a lot of twisting and the stressful motions. And it's a little bit heartbreaking when you read a game story that actually has pitch counts in it, which you can find. And you see hitters standing there and he'll throw 89 pitches in the first inning. I'm not exaggerating. You know, 300 in a game. Uh, you know, there's, there's nobody around today that could do that without falling apart. And this guy had an inherited hernia. Uh, I, now, I don't remember from your book, did anybody in that era figure out what he was doing and copy it? Yeah, good question. Great question. So here's the answer. And this is kind of another fascinating thing. Well, he was instantly emulated by other pitchers. So the guy that was his backup on the Excelsiors is Asa Brainerd, who was the pitcher for the great Cincinnati Red Stockings team, also an everyday pitcher and a dominant pitcher. Well, it tells you something about Creighton that he kept that guy on the bench. Right. When Creighton dies, this guy's the best pitcher in the United States. Yeah. Well, Brainerd, when you read descriptions of his delivery, is doing exactly what Creighton did. So, you know, I had this thought one day because people like Henry Chadwick, who was the baseball journalist and Rules Committee member and a sophisticated observer of the game and other people, clearly couldn't figure out what Creighton was doing. And it kind of bothered me that baseball experts were confused by what he was doing, but other pitchers could copy it. And then I thought, you know, um, that's not that unusual when you think about it. You know, things happen today that get passed from pitcher to pitcher, inside stuff, um, and this was probably true of uh, using like spider tack and things like that. The general public and even journalists don't know about it right away, sometimes for years. Little tricks of how to throw a certain pitch and little ways of cheating and gaming the system. So whatever it was, it was communicable and copyable. Although what happened a few years after Creighton was that people, because of baseball was getting so competitive and became professional in 1871, pitchers started violating the rule against throwing. So what they started doing was they started, uh, you know, using a more of a modern throwing uh, motion underhand and then raising their arm angle gradually which happens in the 1870s, along with the advent of the curveball. And if you're throwing curveballs, you realize that the higher your arm angle, the more effective it is. So there's a gradual process of pushing the envelope of the rules. Well, you know, these guys, like in the mid 1870s, they're bending down like a submarine pitcher and firing the ball with a throwing motion underhand or low sidearm. And then the, the reason that's important is that later writers decided that must have been what Creighton was doing. But I don't think it was. All the descriptions agree that he was throwing dead underhand. And when he was actually trotted in front of Henry Chadwick, who was a member of the Rules Committee in the Amateur era, and they asked Chadwick, is this delivery legal? And he looked at it and said, absolutely. 
And then Chadwick himself, 10 years later, is saying that Creighton was cheating. I really think the problem is they couldn't totally understand what he was doing. But other pitchers did. So, you know, what happens is when Brainerd and other people are emulating Creighton, it's changing the game because they're, they're so much more effective. And then the whole tactic of taking pitches as a tactic this is really boring and distressing, and the rules have to address this. And you know where we're going with this, right? This is this is where the strike zone comes from, ultimately. I found the background of uh, of Creighton very interesting from that uh, the sixth ward, and it, it it seemed like he had different pedigree than a lot of the first amateur teams, which were you know, all where there was a lot of medical professionals and yeah, um, Wall Street guys. Yeah. Bankers. Yeah. So that's, you know, you guys are asking really great questions. Um, the re another interesting thing about Creighton, he had, a, he was a guy of, you could make a long list of firsts for him, but one of them is he might've been the first important recruited athlete because teams didn't recruit players based on skill in his day. If you look at all these clubs, they're people that started out knowing each other, working with each other, living near each other. They're friends, relatives, guys that worked at the same company. Um, that's where it starts. Or they're in the same militia company, like you mentioned, or a firehouse, or all those things. And there was something, it wasn't strictly illegal, but there was something considering, considered a little wrong with going out and recruiting a guy because he was a good second baseman. And no one did it until the 1860s, late eight, middle, middle 1860s. So... When you see, this is interesting, Creighton grows up in the slum in lower Manhattan, and his father managed a cider and porter vault, which was an underground storage facility where stuff fermented. And his father was an Irish immigrant. Um, yeah. So he doesn't have a, you know, a very elevated background socially. And the rest of the Excelsiors are quite well off. You know, they're um, basically wealthy suburbanites. And downtown Brooklyn was a place that wealthy people moved to from Manhattan for a little serenity and a little more space. And so what's he doing on this club? Um, and his father in 1857, when Creighton is about 16 or 17, moves to that neighborhood and ends up in a house that he really can't afford. Um, and you can sort of see what's going on. Well, so there's accusations that Creighton was paid under the table in a way. There's accusations he was cheating with his pitching. But what's the thing that the Excelsiors themselves lied about? Uh, they told a story that he came to Brooklyn as a child, grew up in that neighborhood with all the other guys on the team. That's the lie they told. And that's kind of interesting because we have trouble understanding why you would tell that lie. And the reason yeah. is they didn't want to admit that they had recruited a great athlete. And he might have been the greatest athlete in the United States at his time. The reason I say that is not only a great pitcher, but he, he took up cricket and instantly became the best player in the United States. Um, so somebody figured this out when he was 16, 17 and brought him over to Brooklyn, got his father a house. In fact, they both had no-show jobs at the Federal Customs House in 1860. Um, so, you know, you can sort of see how this thing works. And that was the thing that the club didn't want people to know. Uh, ch changing the subject for 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 a, a minute, um, there's been so much written about early baseball and the the downside of gamblers and hanging around the game and gambling on the game. I I, I think I read correctly that one of the upsides was actually an er early uh, amateur travel ball. They helped fund the movement kind of the spreading of the game when they traveled uh, a, a lot of those expenses were covered by the the gamblers did i did i understand that right it's true that was very common in the 1860s um and in fact gambling has all kinds of positive influences you know it because of the black Sox scandal and for you know because of moral disapproval 
it gets pushed into the shadows. And even at the time, um, Henry Chadwick, the most influential journalist in baseball in the 19th century, despised gambling. And when you push something in the shadows, uh, maybe it has some positive effects, but the negative effect is you don't know anything about it. It's a little bit like steroids. You know, if, if there's a healthy way to do steroids for athletics, we're not going to find out about it because it's illegal or it's against the rules and therefore it's in the shadows. But, you know, one great example of, you know, when, when you have gambling involved, it's a little bit like professionalism. It doesn't sound clean, but it's kind of a cleansing influence because it makes people, it encourages things like transparency about rosters and roles. When there's money on the game, you can't mess around. You know, uh, I don't know your guys' baseball experience. Um, I have a lot of experience with amateur baseball in New York. There's really nothing less ethical than amateur sports, in my opinion. And around here, you can, I've seen games, you know, that where the umpiring was fixed. Um, people, um, when you have gamblers, you can't pull some of these stunts that you can when there's money on the line. And a, there's a good example from 1856, which is really fundamental in the history of baseball. Uh, in those days, you have to understand that clubs basically played 95% of their games intramurally. So people like the Knickerbockers got together, formed two teams, and played. That's most of their score sheets. Playing against another club that we consider sort of the purpose of a baseball club, that was unusual. So in 1856, the Gothams are playing, uh, they are playing the uh, Knickerbockers. And it's unusual, and there's some gamblers there. You know, when you read newspaper stories, they'll say things like, wow, there were 75 people at the game. That's news, because almost no one watched it. And then they say stuff like, uh, members of the sporting fraternity were there or outside friends of the club. And these are euphemisms for gamblers and bookmakers. So there's some gambling interest on this game. And there was a guy named Joseph Pinckney, who was a really good player. He was a pitcher and second baseman and good hitter who had been on the Gothams and he had moved to the unions who played in the Bronx. He shows up at the last minute and plays with his old club. And of course, the gamblers freak out. You can't set the odds, take the bets, and then you know, have, um, you know, Manny Machado show up suddenly playing third for one of the teams. And um, that's what happened. And there was all the screaming and yelling bubbles up into the sporting press. And the interesting thing was at that, in that same summer, there was an effort made to create a national convention, which to govern baseball and make rules about inter club play and other things, standardize the rules. And the Knickerbockers had boycotted it and it died. Well, after they got screwed in this game, by having a ringer come in for the other side, they were very interested in having a meeting like this. And that's how the National Association started in 1857. Uh, the Knickerbockers are now in a leadership position. The National Association ultimately becomes organized baseball. So there's an example of gambling being really, really fundamental in the birth of what we call baseball. I'm a retired parks guy, and I was really interested in your work on Elysian Fields. I just always kind of figured it was an open field, like a cornfield, but it was more like an amusement park. Yeah, it was a little bit of a lot of things. And, you know, the fun part is, you know, when you start, when I, when I learned more about it, I started to make a list of all the things that kind of can trace it as their ancestor. And it's a lot of varied things you wouldn't think about, you know, like Coney Island, Yankee Stadium, Disney World. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, you know, it's um, a fascinating place, and it was owned by one family, the Stevens family. Um, it's a little piece of it is still there and still a park, and another part of it, the family house, is an engineering school called Stevens Institute. Um, that's a really interesting story, and, you know, the thing about baseball fields is they're just places to play. In this case, a family allowed um, these clubs from Manhattan to take the ferry over and use it. And, and with Manhattan running out of space, that helped. But in Brooklyn, um, something happens in the late 1850s that changes the whole picture. And the Elysian Fields had ball fields, but it had no provision for spectators. And like I said, not many people watched a baseball game in the 1850s. But that changed in the late 1850s, um, and it changed because, and it really happened in Brooklyn, 
suddenly ordinary people started coming to games if it was a Brooklyn team facing a New York team. And this sounds like the most obvious thing in the world to us, that there would be an inner city rivalry that would lead into sports. But it was new. And people didn't understand it. You know, Henry Chadwick and some of the other journalists are actually disturbed when thousands of people unexpectedly come to a ball game. I mean, they say funny things like, are they gamblers? Like some of them are women and children. What is going on here? Um, they were a little bit scared by this. Um, you know, it's important to under, when you're understanding early baseball that it wasn't supposed to be entertainment or a profession. And then, you know, the relevance to ballparks is that when people started coming to games, an entrepreneur in Brooklyn in 1862 built a ballpark and he charged admission. And the people got the message that you could make money off it. And, you know, boy, does that change things. Yeah. Jim, all of us that are involved in the vintage uh, baseball community uh, really appreciate your book. Um, there's just so much information in there. We try our best to put on a game in an authentic manner, try to do everything right, uniforms, ruling equipment, and all that. And you've added a lot to that so we can do a better job of that. And also, you really helped us answer the questions. Part of our part of our goal is not only to play a game, but to interact with our spectators and explain what we're doing, what early baseball is like. And so you've helped us answer those questions. We get people come, they put their lawn chair down, they watch for a while, and they, you know, you talk to them and we encourage our players and everybody to talk to the fans during the game. They say, oh, you fellows are doing just like that, ever double day. <laughs> and, you know, in all human sense, they're just trying to be friendly and, you know, talk about it. Say, well, <laughs> not exactly. So we try to explain what really ha happened and what better book. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Uh, that's a big us Answer those questions. Unfortunately, the answers are often very long. <laughs> As you say, we we don't have a neat wrap up, Admiral Doubleday invented, you know, and all that. And even Alexander Cartwright, you know, thirty years ago when I started doing this, we all thought Alexander Cartwright had a bigger role than he he does. And uh, now Doc Adams is getting a lot of uh, of uh, attention as uh, being a more important uh, founder. But anyway, I just want to say this book is so helpful to us as we try to answer those questions as best we can and um, and start conversations with our fans and, and draw them toward the right way. This business about the, your uh, uh, emerging urban bourgeoisie and all that, boy, that's just right on it. I, I thought of that at the same time, you know, reading about the Knickerbockers and the other early clubs that people <coughs> play vintage baseball are just like them. We're just like, you know, middle class, we're not legitimately in our game like it would be in golf, but we're not uh, uh, wealthy gentlemen. You know, some historians have put, always put wealthy gentlemen in there. Right. You know, we're just guys that have jobs. We have a nice enough income that we can afford a uniform and, you know, if there's club dues or to take a road trip or something. But uh, you just explained that so well. So, Thank you. Oh, that's really a thank you. That's a big compliment, and it's a great point. You know, people like to think that baseball is somehow rural because it's played on grass, I guess. But yeah. it's the opposite. I mean, if you know it, if you, the more you learn about the 19th century, the more you realize that somebody who was a farmer or lived in the country in 1840 has zero leisure time, and he doesn't have time to play. He doesn't have time to watch. And you know, when you're looking for who was important in early baseball, these amateurs. And I think it's kind of beautiful that baseball was formed by amateurs, like people like us. Um, and that professional baseball kind of takes up all the space, but amateurs gave them a fully formed sport. They didn't make it. They just learned how to make money off it. You know, people like us founded baseball. And um, uh, where, where was I? Um, 
I lost my train of it. So um, praise us when we get home because that, yeah. that's exactly what <clears throat> the general uh, group of people that do that and all these getting students coast to coast now. Uh, everybody you meet, talk to, you know, they're, they're just like us. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I did get a I did get a kick out of, uh, I, I even noted down the page number on page 229, you listed the 13 men who at one point or another have been described as the father of baseball. And I, I think I kind of recognized and knew maybe seven or eight names, but five or six names I never even heard of before. And I, I mean, that shows you how, it is how funny. wide that is to where people are passing out that title. And I'm sure there's more. In fact, there's three yeah. in the cemetery. But um, yeah, the, uh, you know, the thing about Doubleday is I often find myself when I'm doing a talk or a tour or something, you know, even when you're telling people that Abner Doubleday story is 100% untrue, you almost have trouble believing it yourself. It's hard to believe something's 100% untrue. So, I mean, you know, people will come to me and go, yeah, I get what you're saying, but how could it be totally untrue? <laughs> and uh, we understand exaggeration or spin, but I tell them, you know, there's two connections Abner Doubleday had with baseball, real connections. And one of them is that when he was fighting the Comanches in West Texas in the 1870s, he ordered some baseball equipment for his men. And the other is that uh, I think it was his great, great nephew bought a piece of the Mets in 1980. That's it. <laughs> Uh, John, when do you think the EUB reached its pinnacle, and how does it relate to baseball today? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I sort of see them as a, I don't know how self-conscious this was on the part of people like Henry Chadwick and the other people that are promoting baseball, but I think they saw them as the vehicle to making this game the national sport, because they weren't the only people playing, but they were the people that baseball was marketing itself to. So what you realize when you're researching early baseball is, you know, at some point you realize that the Knickerbockers are being called the first club or the first significant club or whatever by people in a room full of people who knew that wasn't true because there were older clubs in the Knickerbockers. They themselves came out of an older club. So why, don't the, why doesn't this other club count? And the reason is you have to understand baseball is kind of a social movement and the people that think it's a, we a great thing if we have a national sport and this is the right sport if we can keep, keep, keep it clean and we can convince people to do it and it's perfect in all kinds of ways well it ha there was a problem with respectability in those days and sports in fact you know in the victorian period any all-male activity was somewhat suspect you know um gambling uh was was disapproved of um by the middle class and the boxing, horse racing, shooting, all these things that men did in the sporting category had a kind of an ugly side. Um, so there were people like Henry Chadwick are obsessed with respectability. It's one reason he hated gambling. And what better way to sell it than the Knickerbockers are kind of a brand. You know, they're the face that baseball wants to show because they're an emerging, powerful, socially influential group. And as somebody mentioned, easy for us to understand because we can identify with them. But this, in the middle 19th century in America, society's changing and people like them are kind of a new phenomenon. We would just look at them and say, well, they're, they're middle class or upper middle class people. The things that they do and the way they live is very familiar to us. Other people that were playing baseball, like a big group were market traders, butchers and fish dealers and people like that, who had a lot of leisure because they kind of controlled their own industries. They're totally forgotten. We don't have people like that anymore. You know, their businesses aren't run by uh, themselves anymore. They're they're corporate. They're corporatized. Um, so there's 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 stories that are untold because the people have no real kind of descendants. So you know that's the the um, the I think the last sentence of my chapter in the Knickerbockers is you know they didn't create baseball. They were created by baseball, but for a reason that has to do with and it worked selling the sport. Now, this becomes obsolete at a certain point, right? Because the game in the 1860s is so national, so competitive, and professionalism starts to come in. And as soon as there's money on the line, uh, it doesn't really matter 
whether someone is gets along with the guys or he's the same kind of person. He, it only matters how well he plays. So the Knickerbockers are nice to have as founding fathers, but they're not that relevant anymore. And you can see in the late amateur period, there's all these controversies about people saying we're betraying our own values by, in a sense, hiring people. You know the 1870 game where the Atlantics defeat the Cincinnati Red Stockings in June of 1870 and they break this winning streak that had started in late 1868, the big national news. Um, if you read a normal baseball history book, it'll say this is professionalism, you know, the last gasp of amateurism. The Brooklyn Atlantics are amateur and they beat this professional all-star team. Kind of, it's like Camelot story. They win and then they're gone. Well, if you actually read no more about those teams, they were both getting paid. The distinction at the time wasn't were you getting paid. The Atlantics got a cut of the gate. In fact, they made more money in a year than the Red Stockings did because the Red Stockings got paid salaries. And that added up to a lot less than a cut of the gate, if you do the math. What the Brooklyn Papers said when their team won this historic game was, our guys, they're not saying they're amateurs. They're saying they're from Brooklyn which they were. Their guys are hired men. They're mercenaries. He said they're hired from the four quarters of the country simply based on ability, and they considered that embarrassing. And of course, that's our norm now. That's what a baseball team is. Mark? Talk about uh, baseball <clears throat> being kind of anti-British that we don't have cricket. Think there's any correlation to why we have an American football instead of soccer? For soccer's big in England. And absolutely, absolutely. I think those things are related. And in fact, in my book, I talk about how the ancestor of American football, which happened in the Boston Common, a lot of the people involved in it were actually early baseball players. And yeah, I in many ways, in fact, you see it outside of sports too. There's all kinds of ways in which we're not going to be. <clears throat> We want to separate ourselves from the British. And that's really pretty interesting. And a lot of it is forgotten because we're so friendly now. But, you know, the poem Hiawatha is actually has the same motivation. It's supposed to be an American epic poem. Well, how do you write an American epic poem that doesn't owe anything to Europe or England? You use Native American folklore. So Hiawatha is kind of like baseball. It's just in a different context. And, you know, the I was even surprised when I was doing research at the amount of hostility between us and England in the mid and early 19th century. It's pretty shocking. I mean, New York and Boston used to celebrate Evacuation Day, which no one's ever heard of anymore, but it, it died out in the early 20th century. That was the day the British troops left at the end of the revolution. And if you read my book, there's a wonderful thing in 1849 called the Astor Theater Riot, where... Yeah. Right. Fans of an English Shakespearean actor and fans of an American Shakespearean actor are brawling in the streets and people are getting shot. So, you know, if you think sports is too silly, uh, that's probably sillier. It's too silly in arena. <laughs> so, you know, it's an American history lesson. It's pretty fascinating for me to learn about. Well, thank you. Uh, I don't, Stan or Dan, Tom, Tony, did uh, did I miss any questions you guys were trying to ask? Wasn't always looking on the screen. Yeah, I have a question. When, when we were talking, when you were talking about that, the uh, the Don. Hello. Well, you you you, uh, you accidentally muted yourself during the middle of your question. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, could take any pitchers they could not hit. How was Creighton still effective? Why didn't they just take it till he grooved one that they could hit? Well, that's what they were trying to do. And sometimes it actually worked. But, you know, that's a good question. It was a little bit complicated because Creighton's control was so good that he would sort of tantalize people. But um, the, the basic framework of this is that you were kind of on your honor to put the ball over the plate as a pitcher. The rules actually say it has to be pitched to the bat. So the pitcher is supposed to let you hit it. And all he's really working with is trying to make you make bad contact. And the hitter is on his honor to swing at good pitches. The problem is that when the stakes rise, 
and there's more on the line and the game matters more, right? People bend the rules. They, they push it. So this is what was going on. The rules were just breaking down under the pressure of competition. Thank you. Jim? Yeah, we, uh, we hear about the June 19th, 1846 game that the good folks over in Hoboken uh, point to as, you know, the first game between two clubs. What's your take on that? And is, can we, if that's not it, do you know of, it, of another that, you know, could claim that title? Yeah, title? no, I think um, there's no question that that's not the first game between two clubs. Um, you know, the story, as it's usually told, basically, it doesn't really wash, right? I mean, the, the simplest version you, you read is um, that the Knickerbockers invented a game, and then they got some other people to play it, taught them how to play, and then they got thrashed 23 to 1, which is, on the face of it, silly. But, you know, the whole thing is um, made up after the fact, in my opinion. And if you look at that score sheet, for the alleged first game, you know, um, it says uh, KBBC for both sides, Knickerbocker Baseball Club. And somebody crossed out one of the KBBCs and wrote New York Nine, which is not the name of any club that ever existed. What you're talking about here is somebody later interpreting it or fudging it. And the guys on the New York Nine, some of them were Knickerbockers at one time or another. And some of the guys on the Knickerbocker Club, basically you're talking about a situation where a bunch of clubs overlapped. There was sort of a soup of players playing in a pickup game. And the Gothams, Washingtons, uh, Knickerbockers all come out of this group of people. In fact, we know why the Knickerbockers were formed, because one of their members who later moved to California said in an interview, he told the whole story. And he said, he's a member in good standing of this emerging urban bourgeoisie we were talking about. He felt like there was too much riffraff in the game. And he says, it was the game was becoming too popular for some of us and we didn't want to be associated with some of them so we formed a club that was a little more socially exclusive that's why the knickerbockers were formed they didn't want to associate with uh, fish dealers and, and butchers and people like that so the game it's the, the 1846 game is all sort of made up after the fact to support this narrative that isn't true and the other thing is you know what's the first game between two clubs it's kind of the wrong question because like I was saying, for a long time, baseball had been something where a club or a group of, you know, an informal or formal club was just guys getting together and basically playing a pickup game. So playing between two organizations wasn't really the point. Okay. Any final questions? Tom, we, we got one more. Okay. John Farson said, whoever wants to know the heart and mind of America had better know team, had better learn baseball. Do you still think that's true? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, you could turn it around, too, because baseball does reflect who we are in so many ways, more than we think. Even. And it, it's, it's worthwhile to kind of broaden your attention beyond the white lines, because baseball is a phenomenon that happens in our culture, in our economy, in our history, for reasons that aren't necessarily sporting reasons, but you can turn it around and say, you know, if you want to know America, you should know baseball. If you want to know baseball and its origins, you need to know more about early America. And that's kind of the theme of my book. Okay. You look so angry in the author's face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, um, my publisher said I look like a criminal or something or I, I thought I looked serious, but I think my dad said, why, why are you look mad at me in the picture? It, I, I didn't think of that, but now that I look at it, uh, it's not far. <laughs> it's uh, I'm an intense good. guy, but I didn't want to look like a murderer. Uh, all right. Well, Tom, I really appreciate you uh, spending an hour with us and, and added adding depth to uh, the book. I, I, I enjoyed the book and, and a lot of the offshoots. Uh, where you delved into some of the personalities were were intriguing to me because it did fill out the story. So appreciate it. Really appreciate you spending the time with us. Um, no, I thank you a lot for having me on. And there's nothing more fun. You know, when you write a book, you're wondering 
who's going to read it and how people yeah. respond. It'll be more fun than, you know, talking to you all about it. Well, we, we meet quarterly. So uh, we chose your book by, uh, by a democratic process. Awesome. So, all yeah. America. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're, you, you're welcome to stay on the call. What we're going to do next is, uh, is we've got a couple photos for a show and tell that Jim Tootle's going to share and uh, that that'll be quick and then we'll go into picking our next book uh, if you'd like to stick around you're certainly welcome but uh, uh, again we thank you thank you so much and um, you know uh, when I finish my Creighton book I'd be happy to come back all right we, we, we'd like that <laughs> okay thanks again all right yeah All right, Jim. Hey, real quick. I just, this is too good. Okay. 2006, we got the muffins, got an invitation from the people in Salisbury, North Carolina. You read in the book, or I'm sure you've seen the picture before of the famous prison camp game, 1862. It's on the Many, many baseball books. That's an early game. Oops, falling apart. Okay, so the people in Salisbury called the Salisbury Confederate Prison Association have a historical group that they study the history of the prison camp, preserve the parts that are there, and they have a symposium every spring. It's this very weekend right now in Salisbury, North Carolina, they're ha having that. So they usually get about 100 Civil War buffs, prison buffs, scholars, fa faculty pe pe people from di di different uh, schools and all that come and they have it. And two, they invited us to come down. They said, we're interested in the baseball part of it. Uh, could the Muffins come down and play a game and show our symposium people how the game was played then? What is this game going on that we all see in the thing? So we got the invitation in 2006, and we thought that, well, that's a great idea. We'll be glad to do that. We all voted that we would go and have a road trip down there. We thought we could do one better. Let's have, let's be dressed like the guys in the painting rather than wear our baseball uniforms because they're in kind of ragtag mix and match clothes as POWs would be. So we each muffin picked out a guy, usually the person that plays the position that he usually plays and got the dress together of what that guy is uh, wearing. And then we practiced it. We went out to one of these uh, indoor uh, baseball and soccer field up here in Dublin, and we blocked it out just kind of like a play, like, okay, the opening scene here, you know, like I'm I'm a guy and I've got my hands on my knees, and Blake's the next guy, and he's standing like this, and then, you know, he's like four steps away, there's the next guy, and we, we <coughs> planned it all out so that we would be in the same spot, in the same pose with the same clothes. Okay. Didn't mean to rhyme that, but it does. <laughs> now... So we got down. So that photo is on the cover of that of, of the book we just looked at. Now, we read. And not only did we have the um, symposium folks there, but they blocked off the streets and uh, townspeople came out with their lawn chairs and all that. So we had a big crowd. Fortunately, the people down in Salisbury know exactly where the prison walls were and the different buildings and all that. And they know that the place that that game was played on in 1862 is a vacant lot. So they got permission for us to play the game on the actual footprint of the, the war game. Okay, so we got down there and we all took our places on the field in the in the right order uh, perspective around the point, batter, pitcher, catcher, first base, all that stuff. Okay. And everybody's dressed like they, like they would have been. Okay. 
And we had a professional photographer come who had done work at his, he lives in Salisbury, but his work's been published in Sports Illustrated, New York Times and all that stuff, happened to live there. So he came out, got up on a ladder and took photos, you know, the same perspective as the painter. All right, so we did that, great. So then we had a little talk, we explained what was going on to the crowd. And then, you know, first game played on this <laughs> field since 1860s something, right? And, uh, and had a nice crowd and we explained all that. Then we went ahead and played the game. And we got, I think six or seven innings in and it started to rain and everything. But everybody got the general idea of what that would have been like, brought that painting to life of what a game would have been like, underhand pitch and catching on first bound and all that, okay? So we did all that. Then when I got back, Harvey and I know a graphic artist, and she was a student at Ohio State many years ago. And we had her put together to merge the painting and the photograph. And so you can see here every if you look close, you can see that every live person is standing right beside kind of his ghost player that he's portraying in the, okay. So she merged those painting and the photograph together. And then we had copies made so that everybody made the trip, got a keepsake of the trip there. So anyway, it was, a very nice experience. We learned a lot about prison camp life. We learned a lot about baseball in that time. We had a wonderful time that people were so hospitable and appreciative and enjoyed that so much. And so it was just a positive experience. I think we had about 30 in our tra traveling party. We had enough for two baseball teams and then a lot of ladies for their 1860s dresses and all that stuff. So. So it was just a, a real good experience all the way around. I still hear from them all the time. They're, they still stay in touch and still say, what a, thank us for coming down and showing it. So anyway, I just wanted to, I did a program on this. I did a poster program on it at the Sabre in 2012 in uh, Minneapolis. And I did a, you know, half hour talk on it at the, um, North American Society for Sports History in about 2010, something like that. So um, I had this stuff and I thought, hey, wait a minute. This is the time I'm to gonna take those uh, <laughs> photos out and bring them into the, to the gang here, okay? So anyway, you can see them when we're done, but I just want you to, they're just such a memorable experience. We work months to practice and, and do it right so we can run out there in the field and everybody was, and we, we all did that, you know, pose, and wherever, you know, and then we took the photo and the, the crowd loved it. Of course, they could take their own photos. Everybody was there, they were snapping snap away. And, and then and then we played. So it was it was a, a great day. Where so are you just, just to be clear, this is two groups of Union soldier prisoners yes. playing against each other. Yes. It seems odd to me that the Confederate, Confederates would have allowed them to do anything that was Well, fun I'll tell you, prison camps, I'll just tell you in a nutshell how different they were. In 1861 and 62, the prison camps, and we had one here, Camp Chase, out on the west side. They were the guards were very lenient. Everybody was more friendly. They were getting enough to eat. They had recreation. They even had passes to go into town and go to the store. Okay. Same here, Confederate prisoners out of Camp Chase could come in to get a pass, come in downtown and buy some food and go back or, you know, whatever. So down there in Salisbury, they could have passed. So the first year or two of the war, then they were exchanged. They had an exchange uh, program. So Bettisher, the captain that was a professional artist who was a prisoner, did the sketches and all that. And then when he, he got exchanged, so he was there during the summer, I think October, he got exchanged, go back to uh, New, New York and to his uh, studio. And then he painted what he recalled. Okay, so they stopped the, the, uh, the uh, exchanges. And there's kind of two reasons for that, whichever side you take on this. One is the black 
prisoners, once the uh, black soldiers in the Union Army were allowed to enroll in them, and then start, of course, inevitably, they, some would get ca captured. Imagine they weren't treated very well. And so in response, they cut off the exchanges. The other reason is they, you know, they're sued. No matter how thin the pancake, there's always two sides. Right? <laughs> that the Union had plenty of soldiers and they'd stopped exchanging because the Confederates were run out of people. And so they <clears throat> kind of intentionally let people stay in those horrible conditions. We think of prison camp, Andersonville and the skeletons, you know, just awful. They let that happen. And they even, when they found out how bad conditions were in the Southern camps, they cut the rations and the blankets for the people at Camp Chase. So it, it, it was very poor. Most of the deaths at Salisbury occurred during the winter of 64, 65. Or that, I'm gonna say prison wasn't that bad, but it wasn't that bad, you know what I mean? Yeah. So they were, they were getting along, they were getting up to eat more. But then it really got bad. But there's kind of two prison camp stories, you know, early and late. There you go. Well, thank Thanks, you. guys. You know, I have a phrase for this. Only at Sabre do you get this kind of yeah. death of uh, somebody in the group just can really add more to it. I appreciate it, Jim. Let's move into picking the next book. Uh, Stan, Tony, Tom, glad you guys are still with us. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, refresh our memory. And by the way, I, I really enjoyed Tom today. Um, you know that yeah it's uh i had a little bit of a hiccup this morning when i just gave my my phone number to say by the way if you have any problems uh uh, uh logging into the zoom you know here's my cell number you just call me and, and i'll help and he said is it a.m. or p.m.? <laughs> you know, and this was like at 8.15 this morning. So anyway, he hit the curveball, you know, so uh, uh, he from Brooklyn. So anyways, I was, I was, but I mean, the good thing about our format is I, I, I actually specifically say, don't give us slides, just talk and let us, let us be more interactive. So Appreciate everybody kicking in and asking a lot of questions. I think it always adds, you know, adds to the presentation. And like, I think we found in a couple of these books that where some of them can have, parts of them can get dry. The speakers never seem dry. You know, they, they always seem to, you know, bring stuff, stuff to life. So uh, anyway, I, I really enjoyed having them. So I think on this book, rather than some of the other ones, I, I think I gained more from him talking to the place where I wish he would have talked and then I read the book. Yeah. That's why right. I'm going to just go back. Down I think I'll keep... finish it. Now. I have the book, but I didn't finish it. Yeah. Now I think I want to finish the book. After yeah. Plus, I want to read about Jim Craig. Yeah, I find yeah. that fascinating. Yeah, yeah. 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 to pick my ears. <clears throat> right. I have the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here's how we finished up last time for books. You know, the, the, the Gilbert book finished first. Warren Spahn was second. Ernie Banks was third. And fourth was uh, Playing Through the Pain. That was a Ken Caminiti book. Um, and we voted on Parker. Uh, I, I think two and three, I think just we typically whoever finished in the top three automatically gets voted on. So that'd be the Warren Spawn book and the Ernie Banks. Uh, I would like to still keep the steroid book. You know, I, I, I kind of pick Cam and Eddie because I don't have a, I don't despise him. Like, I mean, we could do the book game of shadows, but it's like, you know, I, I had a bad attitude going in cause I just don't like Barry Bonds and, uh, whereas Cam and Eddie, you know, Cam and Eddie, I felt like he owned it. He said I did. You know, I, it, it helped me. Uh, and 
and it cost him his life as it turns out. But anyway, so that's why I picked that. So I, I'd like to at least vote on that then. I was just, that's my plug for it. Um, and then uh, do we want to leave the Parker book on? Uh, I think we had a problem. It was late coming to the library. Um, I, I think the library now has it, but I know that was a problem. Or, book. It's, in the library. it's in the library. There's, uh, I think, multiple copies. Somebody looking it up now. Is that what you're doing, John? No, sure. uh, the book Playing Through the Pain. Is this Spawn book in the library? There's a couple of Spawn books that you're talking about. The one about this and their shells, 16 year old game, and then there's one Spawn biography. Yeah, I, I assume we were doing the biography. I know I got a copy for $2.95 online. Okay. Of which one? That's in the paper. Is it in the library? Is, does anybody want to nominate any other books? I, I would like to. Go ahead. Bill Verdon, A Life in Baseball, written by David Jerome. I met with the author. He's willing to uh, to participate. And 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 if we if the date is is right, he's going to Pittsburgh to do a, a book signing. Uh, he could possibly be here in person. Uh, Bill Bill Verdon book. What was the name of it again? A Life in Baseball. A Life in Baseball. I'm holding it up now. Uh, so. so. So the upside of that is, I mean, I, I'd be really interested in reading it. The downside is going to be, I doubt that the library is going to have it. It's a McFarland book, which means you're, it's probably a $30. No. No, we also, we so, so anyway. So have him as a speaker without selecting the book. Which, which we could do that. Uh, so, uh, uh, Tony had Tony had another idea. Is you know we we can have a we we can have just a guest speaker night and have him talk to us about Bill Verdon without picking it as our book club. And those who want to read it can, but that, that's 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 another option. I, I could I could schedule that. So there's uh, so. fourteen copies of the Kennedy. In the in the in library, Columbus. okay. Library. Oh, oh. Uh, 14, 12 there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's, it's probably the fairest book on at least from the review I read. It was a fair evaluation. The Parker book, a specific book. Uh, it was Cobra. Yeah. Yeah. Is that an autobiography? Uh, I think it was an auto, but no, yeah. he's got a he's got a writer that writes it with him. Yeah. Okay. Did an excellent, him excellent, and excellent podcast on this. Him and the author. Are you looking at on Mike? Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, I didn't win really I worked for the library. So. Ah. All right. <laughs> Which library is it? I'm at the operations center. Okay. Yeah. It's just Cobra. Cobra, yeah, that's not good. Cobra. You're going to get all these snake books. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, you don't want to cut through everything and just have any pirate book. <laughs> well, I, I, I've always wanted that to be the process, but I felt like I got voted out of that, you know. But but we did lead off with Clemania, I think, was the second book, which we didn't vote That's the only on. One we've done. Yeah. And that was before my time. We haven't done a pirate book since. Yeah, so it's nothing else. I mean, I think a Honus Wagner is being a. You know, one of the right. top five. How about, can we do the team that changed baseball? May I have your attention, please? Family yeah. story time will be starting in our first floor meeting room in five minutes. Yeah, so, so, Tony, I'm going to take your suggestion and, and pencil it into a meeting where we yeah, have a guest. I think that's that's a good in between. And take yeah, advantage okay. of somebody who uh, who wants to talk about their book and, and it's a player I'm obviously interested in. I agree. That's a pirate's book. We fish rather. Is that also a McFarland book?
sabermetric book on the fire. I think it's a terrific book. Big data. Yeah. It was a great book. Yeah, I, I really, I mean, I feel like it's a little dated now, probably, but I thought it was an awesome book. All right, here's here's who we here's who I have so far. Uh, Warren Spawn book, Ernie Banks. Did we find out whether the Parker books? I haven't found, found it yet myself. For some reason, we had this problem before that we. It's in the library. I can't tell you how many copies, but it is in the author. You know the author? Dave Parker. He's got a book out is it in the library all right i'm got, we're, we're gonna hold this retire books is that why i know that a lot of times well, they go to the FOL Friends of the Library sale. Yeah. So what you're talking about. That, that may have happened with a part. How of long ago was that? I don't think it ever got there. I don't think it ever got there. How old is it? It's not that old. It's like four or five years. Yeah. I mean, no, I think more like one year. Is it like four or five years old? No. Oh, I don't yeah. even think Maybe it's less. that. I think it's less more than like, two. More like three. It also might be how many times people oh, okay. And that goes, that's part of it. All right. Do we want to vote, vote for that one or not? It seems like it's iffy. So let, let's let's skip that one until we... <laughs> <laughs> All right. one, I can go do that. That's what I was... I'm talking the app. I I was trying the website. But Dave Parker is this. What's the name of Bill Burden's book? Baseball Life. Baseball. Life in Baseball. Go uh, ahead. On the Spawn book, are we talking about his biography? We are. Okay, on the Banks book, which one are we talking about? His biography. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, I, I can clarify. I, I didn't know that he had one of each. Okay. Whichever one was the more recent one. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the autobiography, which I oh, yeah. oh yeah. Okay, so it'd be the newer yes. one. It'd be the newer one. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. So, so what we're voting on is there any other books that we want to nominate that's not a McFarland book? Ever done a book? No. Want to nominate one? I mean, I'm sure the library's got long season or or pennant race. Pennant race. What's that about? Tim Roth. Which one? Let's pick one. Pick one, and I'll put it on here. Well, if you're gonna do one, I think the first one won't. Well, I want you to enjoy the red wing of pennant. Yes. That's something we I think the long season would be good in the compare it with. Uh, some of the later books, you know, like you were talking about some of the different books. It's it's like that. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, the long season. Yeah, the long season. Was it the long season? season. How many copies yeah. of the library? Yeah. How many pages? Yeah. Many pages? Uh, oh. It's it's definitely short. It's definitely a short book because yeah. I yeah. own it. It's, it's going to seem pretty dated in style. Yeah, which is okay. How many copies they have in the library? Probably not many. All right, let's check that before we vote. Thanks for being patient at home, fellas. No problem. <laughs> I like you being part of the long season. Come on, yeah, they wouldn't have very many. Is that Franklin County Library or Columbus? I mean, probably CML, Columbus Metro. All right. Here's what we're voting on, folks. We're, we're voting on Spawn, Banks, Caminiti. We can't find Long Season in the uh, in the library. We, I did, and I'm not including Cobra because 
there's got to be some kind of some other problem uh, that, that that book got banned by the library or something. <laughs> that makes no sense for that to not be. But I know we ran into that before. Did we check the spawn book to see how many copies of it were available? I'd be surprised if it's that many. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if we get down to like a magical number, we'll, we'll, we'll never pick another book. <laughs> yeah, the Banks book is pretty recent, so okay. I would think that that's yeah, they have they have the spawn one for the greatest game ever pitched. How many of those? Let's see. <coughs> two. Yep, two go. That's the other one. I don't see the biography. Anymore on Amazon, if the book's been out for a while, you ought to be able to read the books. Yeah. Read the books. Blake, you buy them, I buy them. I, I, I buy the books. So. But I didn't buy this one. This one I just book. used the Half library. Price books carries a lot of them. So that's it. That's it. You, you can't rely on it. You just go in there and browse and see that. Oh, I'm yeah. yeah. Occasionally they get a buyout. I think I've got two of the ones this season. Keep them back in a hard drive. All right. I think we just I've have got a radical concept. What's that? That's uh, let's go home and see if we can find something and then vote online or something like that. Yeah, I just soon wrap it up here though. Um, Warren Spar um, on um, Amazon uh, for Kindle book is $16.99. We're, we're about ready to lose our connection because somebody else has the. Uh, we gotta, gotta wait for research. Yeah. I'm just throwing this out at all. Uh, we're all here. Like, so all right. We gotta wait for doing the research before we come. We have another chapter that needs to use this. Oh, all right. So, uh, all right. to, to expedite. So, do we just not want to vote? Throw out the books you've got. All right. Yeah. You got nothing to Spawn, there. banks. Yeah. Playing through the pain. Well, the three of them. Three of them. The playing through the pain had several copies. There's 14 of them. All right. How many people? There's only three books. So it's like we're already in the playoff spot. One vote. One vote. Yeah. So I'd say with Spawn, either read either the uh, biography or the other one. It's just, I'm just trying to expedite things. Okay. All right. Spawn. One, two, three. Yeah. Uh, and Thomas, four. Uh, banks. One, two. I vote for Banks. Three. All right, playing through the pain. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. Well, uh, I'll I'll try to do a better job. Try, try to get suggestions to me ahead of time. I mean, I'll I'll own the fact that they they weren't all well researched. Um, and I I don't know what what to say about like how many copies we need to have. At, uh, at, I, I just worry we're going to run out of. Well, and we did always look to see what kind of prices they were yeah. at. Yeah. Yeah. Online services. So, yeah. Well, we, let me just say this. When we started out, we also, well, the first thing we looked at before we went to the library system is we looked at whether or not it was in paperback or not. We find paperback relatively inexpensive. Then we expanded it to the library system. So, I mean, it was those two. Yeah. Systems combined, either paperback or in the library. Pick up a year out and find one where there's two copies and just pass them around. <laughs> no more. Your your memory must be better than mine. It's not good for me. All right, guys, it's the Caminetti book. I'll I'll send something out for the uh, the date uh, coming up. We've got for for local. We we've got a couple Ohio State games that we're going to try to attend together. Uh, week, yes, uh, Friday night, I think, the 28th. And then uh, 
I'm working with the Clippers to try to find a date for our Clippers game. Um, and, and I'm just trying to work a date so to make sure the crew's not in town the same time, which was kind of made parking a little bit more expensive than it needed to be. So guys, thanks for, for tuning in. Uh, that's all. Thanks, thanks guys. Mike. Thanks guys.